Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Servant of God is burdened. Uh, in our ministry, a lot is involved. It takes the mercy of God to remain steadfast. And so one more time, let's honor the set man and the angel over this assignment. God's servant, Apostle Mike had said, celebrate you mightily. Thank you for the honor. I, I don't take it for granted at all to be here. I count it a great honor to be here, to speak to God's people. And I believe somebody will be blessed this morning in Jesus' name. Again, I celebrate God's servant, Dr. Robert Burali. Thank you so much. So good to see you. I want to particularly honor the father of the set man, the, the Rinche, because there's a tree that begat this day. So let's celebrate daddy this morning. <laughs> And so I'm not saying this one is big because this is not photocopy. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise God. Salute all the pastors. Thank you so much. Thank you for standing with the man of God. God's servant, thank you so much for opening up your place. Thank you, prophet. Thank you so much. God's servant is an honor. And it's good to see my brother Marvin. Good to see you. Thank you. I came with my brethren also. Pastor Godwin, Pastor Sonny. Pastor Richard and Pastor King, thank you so much. God bless you. When I walked in here, I saw that um, the atmosphere was so intense. The Word of God has come powerfully. The power of God has moved so intensely. And so I'll just do a little bit of capping for a short while so we can take time to internalize what we've received. Because it's not in the volume, it is in the depth. It is in the internalization of what we have received. So in order not to take us too far from what God has brought already this morning, I'll just share a, br a brief, a, a few things that will help us solidify on our walk with God. Can we just bow our heads one more time and honor the Lord? Just tell Him how much you love Him this morning. Appreciate Him for the gift of life. Thank Him for the privilege of knowing Him. Thank, you for the, thank Him for the honor of being called into the service of the Master. We give you praise, we give you glory. Thank you, Holy Father. Ah, there was a song, there was a song your pe people were singing yesterday. I think it's Solomon, Solomon Lange's song. Yes. We couldn't recover from that song. In, in fact, we kept singing it. Throughout this morning. Father, Father, this worship is yours. Father, Father, this worship is yours. From my heart of heart, from the depths of my soul, yeah. Father, this worship is yours. Father, Father. Father, Father, this worship is yours. Somebody cry, Father, Father, this worship is yours. From my heart to the depths of my soul, Father, this worship is yours. Father, Father, say, Father, Father.
Father, we thank you for the privilege again. We ask that you speak to us this morning in Jesus' name. Please be seated. God bless you. I was overtaken last night and I didn't know some fleshly things were still happening even before I came up. You know, it grieves the heart of God when according to his counsel, predetermining counsel, he chose the people, prepares a heritage for them, and they can't enter. It grieves the heart of God. You know, if you have met a serious man, a focused man before, you will marvel at the value he places on time. If you meet a great man, a really great man. In fact, sometimes when you meet certain men by 8 a.m., they walk, they done that day. It's more than what others will do in one week. And you find them walking into the night. 2 a.m., they are still active because there is so much to do. Now, because of the much they have to do, they value time so much. In fact, one of the common things you find with great men is that they hate time wasted. Every second counts. They try to productively deploy time because of what they achieve with time. In fact, time is a superior currency to a great man than money. He can pay people to help him maximize time because of what time represents to him. Now, if that level of attention, if that level of diligence is put into recovering time, you will now understand how God feels when He allocates a season and a heritage to a people and time passes and God is just watching them and they are not moved. They are not even aware of the urgency in the Spirit. And so many times when God really wants to get people's attention, He brings burdens. Bodings are spiritual communication systems from the heart of God to the heart of men to help them understand the urgency of time and what he wants to achieve in his corporate agenda. I'm saying this to let you know that we are behind schedule in the dealings of God. There's so much God wants to do now that it's almost a sin for us to sleep and to waste time. And to make the worst of it, we are not even aware that there's urgency in the spirit. And so you find people fighting themselves, gossiping, keeping malice, wasting time, time that is of the essence. Meanwhile, what we have been called to partake of and to participate in is not isolated to our generation. It's a continuum. It's what God has been doing. It's just the portion that is allocated to our generation. You know, it's just like this building you are seeing. The building, the block you find somewhere here is not in isolation. This block is standing on other blocks that have they built on. So, if this block doesn't know what is happening, it will realize that there's been a foundation buried under the soil that doesn't even have the privilege of seeing the light of day. 
So, the gospel we are preaching today and the assignment God wants us to fulfill, we are able to do what we are doing now because some people were martyred. Some people were slaughtered. Some people were burnt alive. This thing we are doing casually. And that's not just the case. If this block does not play its part, the roof won't come on. And so God has an eternal agenda. And is waiting for our generation to play her part. To complement what the previous generations have done. And also to give him the opportunity to allow the next generation to come on the scene. And we are casual. So it grieves the heart of God. It's not a body. That's why God sometimes comes with so much vehemence to draw our attention to what matters. That this thing is not about us. It's a divine agenda. So much is involved. People, millions of people died for this cause. You don't know where prophets went to in intercession to be able to isolate the counsel of God for your city. And a man will speak the mind of God for your city. And that utterance is waiting for the generation that will fulfill it. It took prayers. It took fastings. It took self-denial. To be able to reach that point where that secret was kept. And he spoke. And mentioned your city in particular. And then you want to walk through this city like every other person. Such a body. Such a body. This morning I want to share with us some of the spiritual parameters that we must guard with all our lives in order to fulfill divine mandates. I call it the culture of a spiritual man. You are not a spiritual man because you sustain a frown. You are not a spiritual man because you sustain a superficial disposition that suggests a hard posture of spirituality. Everybody who is a spiritual man, genuinely, they are cultures. Some are intrinsic and some are extrinsic. Intrinsic because they are wired into him. They define his essence. And extrinsic because they are part of the activities that regulate him. Every man who fulfills destiny must be governed by these realities. And as I begin to share you will discover that as God begins to become more serious with you, these things will become a law to you. There are those who are internal that you have to sense and manage and sustain. And there are others that are external that you have to preserve in order to secure your environment. You know, I began telling us yesterday that there were two dimensions of the Christ that gave him the authority to fulfill destiny. He was a child, and so that spoke about his birthing and his growth process. And then he was a son. That spoke about his responsibility in the kingdom. And I told us as a child, there were three sensitive stages he got into. The first stage was the stage of incarnation, where he had to become a man, in order to fulfill an agenda that is man-oriented. And that's what we call the incarnation. And that incarnation is Jesus' identification with the human race. Because if he doesn't identify with the human race, there will be no spiritual legitimacy for him to fulfill an agenda that is allocated to humankind. And then I said the second place he got into was the baptism. And the baptism was his identification with the sinful man. Because even when he identified with the human race, he was without sin. He was without guilt. And so, if he died like that, he would not have carried the guilt of man. And so, in baptism, Jesus submerged himself in the guilt of humanity so that he could also be called a man like every other person. And then I said the third level was at the cross. At the cross, he did not just identify with the sinful man, he identified with the sin of man. That's why the Bible said God made him that was without sin to become sin. He was not a sinner 
But he identified with the sin of man. All of that process was tied to his participation with man so that he could bear the yoke and the judgment that was upon man. But there was another corridor that Jesus had to travel through in order to bear the responsibility on behalf of man. And that corridor was the corridor of sonship. And the reason it's necessary is because Jesus is the pattern man. Everything that happens to Jesus is what will happen to us. His life becomes a definition to us. When he was baptized, the voice came from heaven and said, This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. When he was transfigured, the voice came again and said, This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. So he is the pattern man. So Jesus' life was a compass for humanity. And we saw that the way Jesus was able to play that responsibility because kingdom responsibility is for sons. And the way he was able to play that responsibility was, number one, to subdue flesh. He died. He won the battle over flesh. And that's what I call the sufferings of the flesh. The ability to shut down the propensities of the flesh. Because your flesh will always rise up to negate the promptings of God. And as, your, as the promptings of God are negated, it will become impossible for you to fulfill God's agenda for your life. And so I said, everyone who is a son must go the way of suffering. The Bible said in Hebrews 5, 8, that he learned obedience through the things he suffered. And I said that suffering is twofold. The first is suffering in the flesh. And so we must come to that point where we will subject ourselves to spiritual rigor in order to subside the propensities of the flesh. It's not every time you feel like gossiping that you should gossip. In fact, you shouldn't gossip. But for you to live above gossip, there is a rigor that the Holy Ghost will subject you to. And as you subject yourself to that, 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 that prescription of the Holy Spirit, you will discover that those propensities will be subdued. The lost, the lost thing. Every lady you see, you want to play with. You want to have something to do with. And you are hiding it. You can't grow to sonship. It will weaken the possibilities of your destiny. But for you to be able to live above it, you must come under the government of the Holy Spirit and align with the prescriptions of the Holy Spirit in order to kill the flesh. That prescription of the Holy Spirit is what we call the sufferings of flesh. And so in 1 Peter chapter 4 verse 1, it says, Him that have suffered in the flesh has ceased from sinning. So there is no way you can subdue flesh unless you have suffered in the flesh. And I said the second suffering is the suffering of persecution for righteousness sake. Because when you suffer in the flesh and your righteousness becomes obvious, those who are not willing to suffer in the flesh will now antagonize you. Because what God begins to do in your life, they want to kill it. Suddenly they wake up and say, you, you are boasting. Are you the only person that what you are doing is English language? They wake up and say, what you are doing is you are, show, you are showing yourself off. Meanwhile, it is the energy of the Holy Ghost on your inside. That energy has risen because you have subdued flesh. And they have not subdued flesh. And because they have not subdued flesh, they don't want you to rise. Because there is a crowd mentality around the African people in particular. Anything they are not doing or God is not doing with them, God must not do with somebody else. And so they will fight you for your fasting. They will fight you for your fire. They will fight you for the grace of God that is on your life. They will fight you for your gift. They want to do everything for you to be destroyed. And so we keep destroying ourselves and nobody rises. But if you have suffered in the flesh, you will also make up your mind to suffer for righteousness sake. And so that is the point where no matter what they say, you know those who are marking your script are not on earth, they are in heaven. And so you are not moved. You just stay focused and you keep doing what you are doing. By the time you perfect suffering, there is something else you need to do. It's called yieldedness to the Holy Spirit. It says, as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. When these two things are in place, then we will build the capacity to sustain kingdom. Now, if you journey to this point, you will discover that some cultures would have been formed in your life. You cannot arrive here and these things are not there. 
you will just discover they are there. Now, for you to remain here, you will now monitor, manage, and steward these things. Because these things now will become the foundations of your spiritual life. And that foundation is what will determine the extent to which God can use you. That foundation is what will determine the extent of deliverance that you can bring to Jacob. That foundation is what will determine the level to which you can bring light to your people. And so the problem with many persons is that the moment God begins to help them, they negate these things. Either they die, or they violate them, or they negate them, and they slip away. And so I want to itemize eight of them for you this morning, and I'm really going to be fast. And in order for me not to break into inspiration, I'll be reading, by, I'll be reading verses of scripture to help you write it so you can meditate on these scriptures, study these scriptures, and make them yours. Are we together? And so the cultures of a spiritual man or the consecration of a spiritual man or the life force of a spiritual man is what determines the level of impact he can make in the generation. If he loses these things, his life will become an impression. Himself will know that he will start acting to meet up. Because these are the things that give potency, punch and power to his spiritual engagement. And so let me begin very quickly, since we are not, time is not so friendly. The first thing that begins to happen to you, which is very organic, because I'll begin with the organic ones before I go into the, the more physical or mechanical ones. When I say organic, I mean it's life. It's life-oriented. It's not something you can make happen yourself. You can just discover it and manage it. For example, I explain something to you. Fire is organic. It's God that sets you on fire. There's nothing you can do about it. Now, when the fire comes, you will just notice that something is happening with you. You can wake up at night and pray to morning. And you will not struggle with sleep one second. And when morning comes, you will not be tired. You will still wake up and be doing your normal thing as if you were sleeping. That's organic. If that fire dies, if you want to do it mechanically, you may need to put your leg in water. To be able to survive 30 minutes of prayer at night. Even at that, you will sleep. And you will sleep for, for praying for 30 minutes. The next day, you will not be able to wake up. You will say, Kai, I was in an all night. No. You were in a 30 minutes prayer in the night. It was not an all night. When it becomes mechanical, you will need grace to support it. Are we together? But when it's organic, the grace flows naturally from within you. So, there are eight of these things that if you've not had, you will trust God that you will have it. And if you have it, you will have to guide it. Because this is what will define your life. You know, God had to teach me these things. That every other thing is secondary. These are the main things in spiritual development and in impact making. He told me, connecting with people, receiving assistance from people are all secondary. And many people don't know these things. They turn ministry to politics. They turn serving God to politics. Trying to use physical means, you will just weary away. If these things are there, the people that you need in your destiny, God will put them under pressure. They will find you, they will keep you, they will honor you. Because if it's not God doing it, you will ridicule yourself, you will rubbish yourself, and you will still not be valued. And so when I discover these things, I face them. And as I face them, things happen naturally. My brother, and the things happening are strange. They are really strange. I'm trusting God that somebody, somebody will catch this thing. Yeah. Even if it's three people, it's fine. But somebody, by all means, I'm praying and hoping somebody will catch this thing. I'm just hoping. The first thing that defines a spiritual man is what we call hunger for God. Hunger. I'm not talking hunger for preaching. I'm not talking hunger for ministry. I'm not talking quest for fame. I'm not talking about God lift me. Let me show these people that me too I'm important. That's not what I'm saying. 
I'm talking pure hunger for God that you desire God and you gain satisfaction when you are with God. If it is happening to you, know that your work is pure. In fact, the parameter to judge the purity of a man's intent is the connection he has to God. A man that is still accurate is not a man who is preaching the right doctrine. A man who is still accurate is a man whose connection with God is vital. That connection is like bread. If he doesn't make contact with God, he misses God like he misses food. As in, periodically, God will literally be drawing him to his presence. You see the way you have not eaten and it's getting to 12, you're almost dying. You know that your life is tied to food. If you don't eat in three days, you become a different man. Everybody will know that something is wrong. And if you don't eat in seven days, every activity will shut down. A man who doesn't have hunger for God can be running activity when there's no relationship. That's not a spiritual man. If a spiritual man, if a spiritual man's connection with God breaks, one week is too much. Every activity will die. The meetings will shut down. The engagement with people will shut down because it's stronger on his soul than food. Maybe you should live here and try a seven days dry fast. And see if you'll be able to carry your phone to make call for five minutes. You will discover suddenly that even your hand is heavy. Carry your hand up will become a serious activity. Because of how your natural life is tied to food. If you don't know that your spiritual life is also tied to your intimacy with God, you will still be looking for platform to preach. And you will be talking parables as a wise man. You will be connecting with people. And you will be acting big. You will not know you are dead. Because many people on the pulpit are dead. It's dead men talking. That's why they can't impact people. That's why you hear them. Nothing moves here. They are dead men. Life is not transmitted. So when you find a man who is a spiritual man, the first thing that defines him is hunger. And he manages it with his life. That man can shut down a meeting to sustain that thing. No matter the honorarium that is promised him. And that man, he wakes up with God. He sleeps with God. I'm not talking preparation for meeting. The message we're hearing this morning has nothing to do with this anymore. You'll find him searching the word of God. You'll find him praying. You'll find him on the retreat. He's not going for a program. He's just loving God. He's just loving God. And if that disconnection happens, it's like sickness to him. He can't hold himself. Hunger. In John chapter 2 verse 17, here was Jesus talking. He went into the synagogue to pray and to seek the face of God. And he found people doing other businesses. And for the first time, we saw Jesus as though he lost his temper. He made a cord of many whips and flung them out of the temple. And he said, you will not turn my father's house to a den of thieves. He said, the house of God is a house of prayer. The house of God is a place of connection. So Jesus was seeking connection with God. And he came to meet people who were doing business. He couldn't hold himself. He plucked them out. And the Bible said in John 2.17 that the disciples remembered that it was written, the zeal of my father's house has consumed me. There was hunger. There is no way hunger will dominate you that you will not make transgenerational impact. Because what you connect to is eternal. In Psalm 63 verse 1 and 2, Hear the testimony of David. O oh God, thou art my God. This is a king. You know, that O oh God is an exclamation. It's like a man who has come to a point where, Oh my God, all I am, all I have is you. He said, Thou art my God. He said, Early will I seek thee. He said, My soul tasted for thee. My flesh longed for thee. And see the illustration the guy is using. He said, In a dry and in a thirsty land where there's no water. That's what the guy is. This is a man trying to describe his soul structure. Have you been to a desert before? I was flying to Egypt the other time. 
And we went over the Sahara Desert. My God. It's a sea of dry land. You will see white sand with dust. So thick and heavy, you will be afraid. It looks as if the, the plane will burst into it. The contours of sand. Body of sand. And if you see the dryness. If they drop you there for 30 minutes. Every fluid in your body will dry. Have you seen people who walk in a dry place until their whole lips becomes white and dry and it cuts? That's the description the psalmist was making concerning his soul when it has to do with his quest for God. He's never satisfied. The more he pours into himself, the more dry he is. He said, my soul tests for thee. This is the king who should live for pleasure, who should be concerned about the throne, who should be concerned about what people think. But he was more concerned about the presence of God. How can this kind of man ever lose relevance? How can this kind of man not always find favor with God? You know, we think walking with God, impact and greatness are many things that they are not. And so when a man is sitting 500 people, even himself starts feeling important. Because 500 people gather around him. Whereas this man has no relationship with God. And that doesn't matter. So long as he throws into the meeting and there are 500 people. And he talks. Sometimes people fall down. He is giving himself a false sense of importance. Because 500 people are coming to hear him. Or because you have invitations from one place to another. Or you sang and everybody in the fellowship is suddenly saying, My God, you are gifted. When you were singing, this was happening. Oh God, all of that is nothing. If the relationship you have with God has caught up, God should dominate you so much so that it's difficult for you to think outside God. As you are driving, God is talking to you. As you are in the market, God is talking to you. As you are talking, you are talking God. That's how a man should be saturated. Those are the things that give us value. It's not the people that gather around us or the kind of auditorium we are sitting in or the places we've gone to or the popularity we have. All of that is deception. It will vanish overnight. You will be so shocked. And so what we should guard with our soul if we will make impact and not impression is our relationship with God. You should be so close to God that if you take one step off the lane, you will hear God three times. And if you don't return to order, you will lose your peace. You will lose your sleep. And nothing works until you return to what, where God wants you to be. That's what makes you a spiritual man. You are not a spiritual man because you are talking to a lot of people. You are not a spiritual man because you are popular. You are not a spiritual man because you are influential among men. You are a spiritual man because there is a vital connectivity between you and God. This is what the psalmist was teaching us from scripture. Hear what the philosopher said. Who happens to be the son of the psalmist? Who was taught the way of the spirit? In Songs of Solomon, chapter 1, verse 2 and 4. He said, let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. He said, thy love is better than one. You know, these men, they had such a personal relationship with God that they didn't know how to express it. So, they looked for the most passionate thing among men to use to qualify their relationship with God. The way passion is inflamed by kiss among two lovers. That's what this guy could use to describe what he was feeling towards God. And the way men are obsessed with wine. Until they are drunk and they forget everything. These were the qualifiers that this brother was using to describe what he was feeling towards God. He said, kiss me. If you are about to get married and you are seeking the attention of a lady, that's when you understand this scripture. You will not know this scripture until you are about to get married or you find the lady and sometimes one week to the wedding becomes like one year. If the lady shows up, even her fingernails, you are sensitive. Sometimes it looks as if you want to grab her. And hold her like that for one year. You, you, are, you don't want to leave her. You just want to hold her like this. Everything from her fascinates you. 
This is the kind of passion that this guy is describing. That when he goes to the place of prayer, he's not just speaking in tongues. He wants to hold God. He wants to hold God. He wants to do his, his passion. That's, that's a spiritual man. Do you think this kind of man has energy for gossip? Do you think this kind of man can be carried away by fame? For those of us who fear God, when you want to marry, you now discover you stop visiting yourself. Because you can't trust yourself anymore. You say, no, no, no. I will not visit. Don't visit me. I won't visit you. If we must see, let it be in an open place. Because what you are feeling, you don't want to regret later. So in order not to, you just you, you block every, everything that allows proximity without accountab- accountability. Proximity without accountability becomes a risk at that time because your passion is overwhelming you. This is what a spiritual man is describing that he feels about God. So this kind of man doesn't pride in prayer because what he's looking for is not a title. What he's looking for is God. He wants to plunge into God. He doesn't pride himself in the honors that man gives him. If you ask yourself sincerely, even when you are praying, do you feel like this towards God? That's why we have not started. We are popular, but we have not started. People look at us and they call us names. They don't know that we have not even begun working with God. He said, kiss me. He said, thy love is better than wine. He said, because of the sabbath of thy good ointment, he said, thy name, are you speaking? He said, thy name is as ointment, poured forth. The name of God to him is like a fragrance of a perfume. So when that man is around and you say, Jesus, ah, there's a way he feels. He feels excited when he hears the name of God, Jesus. It's like, it's like perfume. They are pouring a drum of perfume. The way the aroma fills the beauty. When you call the name of God, that's how it feels. You see that these things are organic. Most of us, the only time we felt like this was the week we gave our heart to Christ. Because that week you gave your heart to Christ, in the same foundation school, it's 10 kilometers, you will trek there. You wanted to hear everything about God. If they say there is VG every day of the week, you are going. You are excited. But now, Bible study is 5, you come by 7. What are you doing? Nothing. You stood up from your room, you went outside, looked at the sun, you came back, carried your phone, pressed some buttons, you say, Ka, it's time for meeting. Okay, let me bath. You go to take your shower, you now sit down and discuss with somebody about Barcelona and argue between Messi and Ronaldo. Then, when you later run into the bathroom, you are coming to church, you are sharing the grief. Even you, in your heart, you are thanking God that the prayer time is almost over. In fact, sometimes people deliberately wait for time to go. When it remains to 10 minutes to close up, they will now walk in. They are thanking God that the prayer is about to end. If somebody is leading prayer and is not stopping to raise prayer points, you get offended with the person. Why is he stretching this prayer for this long? If they are praying and meeting is supposed to end by 8, 5 minutes past 8, you are already offended. Why is, he, why is this person not stopping? Why is he not stopping? Because you want to run out. They are sharing the word of God. You are already dope enough. The moment they stop sharing the word of God, you become active again. Because there is no passion. And then we come and act like spiritual men. The angels will look at you and wonder. They say, this one is, is it bipolar disorder? In verse 4, it says, draw me, and I will run after thee. This is one person describing relationship. It began by calling it a passionate kiss between two lovers. That's passion. He entered by saying, it is sweeter than wine. He entered by saying, your name is like ointment poured forth, so the virgins love you. This is somebody describing relationship. From a kiss to a desire stronger than wine, to a a fragrance sweeter than a perfume poured forth. And then he went forward and said, draw me, I want to run after you. 
That's a man who forgets himself. He said, my king has brought me into his bedchamber. He said, we will be glad and rejoice in thee. We will remember thy love more than wine. We will remember. He doesn't want to forget. That's a spiritual man. A man that has hunger for God. These are the things we are losing in church. We are replacing these things with loud preaching. Bogus preaching. We are replacing these things with volume. Volume is no hunger. We are replacing these things with charisma and gesticulation. That you are preaching and doing like this. It doesn't mean you are on fire for God. No, that's not fire. That's youthfulness. It's called adrenaline secretion and lack of comportment. When you become 45 and 50, you will know that you look funny doing like this. In the name of Jesus. When we weigh you, we know you are 20 something years old. When you become 40, you will know that hearing God and touching God is more important than drama. Somebody wants to pray. He now go and hold the altar like this. <laughs> Even that altar is a distraction. If you stop him and say, what has God said? Since you have been praying for two hours, he has not heard anything. Because he's not connected to God. He's trying to make people know that this fire on him wants to kill him. This fire on him. is human validation he's looking for. Drama. Drama. And trust me, I know the dynamics of prayer. I know when the energy of God overwhelms you. And you lose coordination. But it's not something you do in the flesh. That one is parasitism. You want people to look at you and hail you. And Jesus said you have your reward. Passion. Passion. That round the clock you are connected to God. You love him. You can't qualify your relationship with him. A man is calling intimacy kisses. Love sweeter than wine. Sweeter than perfume. Ah uh ah. -uh. Is it the same God that we are all serving? Hunger. If we will make impact, these are the things we should pursue. You should be troubled that your love for God is weighing, weighing down. You should be troubled that your hunger for God is dying. It should threaten you, you should be afraid. Because you are about to die. When your spiritual life dies, your physical life dies. The second thing that defines a spiritual man, remember, I say I'm taking the organic ones before I go to the mechanical ones. When that hunger becomes so strong, then you enter the next level. The next level is the level of bodies. When God sees that you are pursuing after him so passionately, what he now does is that he begins to share with you what is in his heart. That's what we call a body. You know, when you hang around someone for a while, the person now begins to share with you what he wants to do. My friend Richard used to come to see me all the time. Even when I'm not talking, he's smiling. When I'm talking, he's smiling. I say, ah, ah, what is happening? He will just be around. After a while, when I started traveling, since he drives well, I said, okay, let's join. So he started driving me. Everywhere we go, we are, we are, we are on, on, on high, high, high speed. High speed. He's a pilot. Now, I wouldn't give him that responsibility except that he was around. After a while, he began to coordinate my itinerary. Now, those, those are now secret matters. And so, because he coordinates my itinerary now, he's always talking with my wife. So, they will plan my movement and define and determine which one I go for and which one I don't go for. So, most people who want to invite me now will need to know how to make them smart. Now, that, that, that is body. You know, I used to plan my itinerary before. 
But now, somebody is around and I've noticed some level of competence. So, I'm, I've now handed that responsibility to So, I don't think about where to go next week. They think it for me. When a man begins to pursue God, a point comes, God now shares body. That's when God will tell you, I have a plan for Boko. If you don't come to a level where it becomes a body, you will not be part of those God we raise. That's when God will tell you, I want to help young ladies in this city. That's when God will tell you, I want to address the spirit of violence. And so you move from hunger into bodies. That body now is what will begin to affect your life. So when you see a spiritual man who sustains a disposition, the disposition is a response to bodies. There are certain bodies God will put on you that it may be difficult for you to laugh all the time. For example, God can give you a body to watch at night. If you are watching for four hours every night, your daytime will not be full of luxury. Because you'll be trying to recover. You'll discover that you'll become temperate in your operations. If God puts a body on your finances, say, sponsor this vision, sponsor that vision, there are some shoes you won't buy again. There are some holidays you would have loved to, but you won't go. The reason is because God is sharing a body with you. And because of that, it will now begin to impact you. That's why the pathway of a spiritual man is narrow. It's narrow because bodies make them narrow. If God tells you to pray for four hours or five hours every day, your friends will reduce. And the time you have to hang out will also reduce. Because that prayer time is a body. And because you have to meet it, it will now trim your life. So these are the things that shape the path of a spiritual man. Ezekiel, let me read the scripture. Ezekiel chapter 4, verse 4 and verse 8. This is the burden that God wanted to share with a prophet. Now, this guy had a normal life, the way you and I do. Going about his everyday living. But his hunger for God became so much, so God came to share a burden with him. And look at the burden God shared with him. In Ezekiel 4 verse 4, he said, Lie down also upon your left side. He said, lie down on your left side. That's the body. He said, and lay the iniquity of the house of Israel upon it. According to the number of the days thou shalt lie down, you shall bear that iniquity. You know how many days? It was 390 days. Somebody who was doing his business, God suddenly come and say, Go and lie on your left side and be interceding for Israel for 390 days. You know what that means? All the business is doing will shut down. It's called a body. God can't trust you with a body unless he first of all sees your hunger for him. And when he finished, in verse 8, God now went further and said, Lie on your right hand side and intercede for the iniquity of Judah for 40 days. So Ezekiel laid on one spot for 430 days. That's more than one year. What if Ezekiel was planning to marry that year? This is a spiritual man. A spiritual man is a prisoner of Christ. This is where Paul got to. Paul began, he said, I'm an apostle, a preacher and a teacher. A point came, Paul said, I'm a prisoner of Christ. Because the bodies became many. Bodies will increase and it will now shape you. And will shape you into a kind of person. Those days I used to talk about people derogatorily who can pick their cause. I said, what do you mean? What are you doing? That somebody will call you, you can't pick. How many minutes do you pick cause? <laughs> I've repented Because when God puts the burden of a nation on you You have to plan where If I carry my phone now I have Let me show you something I have 1,594 unread messages 
1,594 unread messages. Not read. This is the one I've been able to hand Because there are sick people calling. There are people who need to pay school fees calling. There are hungry people calling. Now, I'm afraid of picking calls because if I pick one call, even if it's for two, three minutes, before I drop it, another call will be ringing. And because it's ringing when I'm busy, the person will know that I'm with the phone. So sometimes I will pick one innocent call, and as I'm talking, another one comes in, I will talk to that one, talk. You will now be on call for three hours. And if you don't stop, it won't stop. So now, those who know me, they call me around 1 a.m. in the morning. If what you want to tell me is serious, that's when you can. You, we, me and you, we wait till that time. Because there are many things around my clock now that makes it difficult for me. I no longer have the luxury of talking to somebody for 30 minutes on phone. I didn't know before. They will know here, sometimes I walk from Sunday to Sunday. And some of my meetings, I have to push them into 11 p.m. To be able to have them in the itinerary. But the reason is because God can entrust you with it. So when God sees your hunger, God now begins to give you burdens. So you share in the burdens of God. It is in the corridor of burden that you lose your life. Because you can't keep your life and share God's body. That's why a spiritual man does not have a life. God will take that life and substitute it with the things that are in his agenda. And this is why spirituality is not a title. It's a responsibility. Your hunger will graduate you to a point of body where God can trust you with things. Trust you with responsibilities. Those responsibilities now will define your life. In Hebrews chapter 11 verse 26 The Bible was speaking about Moses It said he esteemed the reproach of Christ Greater riches than the treasures of Egypt For he had respect unto the recompense of the reward And so those who bear the burdens of God They bear the burdens of God because they value the reward that God gives for those bodies. So they know that accepting what God wants them to do is not a disadvantage to them. There's a reward that makes up for it. Because it will really almost become a reproach to your life. That's why they call it the reproach of Christ. The shame, the persecutions, the responsibilities that God will put on you that will narrow your life until you will almost become useless. It's like wasting your life on Jesus. But if you don't love God enough, He won't even waste His time because He knows you have no respect for the reward. And so when a spiritual man is walking with God, he begins first by showing his fidelity through hunger and love for God. And when God sees that hunger, the way God validates it is by giving him a body. Now, when you migrate from body, you now come to the third layer, which is the third culture of a spiritual man. It's called the fear of the Lord. These things I'm telling you, they are bigger than ministry. It is better you lose your ministry and keep this than to lose this and keep your ministry. Because you would have lost all. The fear. You find a spiritual man he trembles at God. He fidgets. In the presence of God, he submits everything. These are the things that qualifies a spiritual man. A spiritual man is not somebody that prays in tongues loud. Praying in tongues is a byproduct of the reactions going on in your spirit. A spiritual man must pray. But over and above prayer, there are life-oriented realities that define him. Those are the things God looks at. Fear. You will better go hungry than touch God's money. You will go hungry. 
think. Huh? Oh God. I wish the things the fathers knew that allowed God to entrust them with so much authority will know it. You know, we think because we are in the media age that ministry is about online visibility. We think authority is about online visibility. That 15,000 people watched your video, stumbled on it for two seconds, and you came and saw 15,000 views, 20,000 views. You now start working as an important man. There are many people who are not online. They are the gatekeepers of this city. They are not online. They are the gatekeepers. Did you not read about Anna, the prophetess, and Simeon, the prophet? Nobody knew them. Not in church or outside church. They were just hidden. But when they gave birth to Jesus, the Bible said Simeon was moved by the Spirit into the temple. And he was the one who spoke over the Messiah. He said, now my eyes have seen the salvation of God. I can depart in peace. What do you mean? That means God will not let him go until Jesus comes. Because if he goes, Jesus will not come. It was his prayer that prepared the spiritual atmosphere for the coming of Christ. Nobody knew him anywhere. And he was too spiritual to look for men's validation as a basis for his rank in the spirit. He didn't need anybody. When he walked into the temple, he didn't greet anybody. He was not a part of the Sanhedrin. He was in the temple, but he was not part of them. And when he came and finished his assignment, he walked away. I'm not looking for human validation. Where I stand, it is the immortals that clap for me. We are people of vanity. And because of our foolish injury, when we were growing up, we were marginalized. When we were growing up, we were oppressed. So now we want to use online visibility and human approval to heal this, the injury of our soul. And we think it's power and spirituality. You are somebody who never enjoyed love when you were growing up. And so you are looking for everything that makes it look as if people care for you. And so you can use ministry to make that bargain. And you are doing everything for people to like to. And when they like, it makes you feel happy. And because you feel happy, you think that is ministry. It was in the last election that God delivered me from the online charade. They listed four presidential candidates. All of them had more than 100,000 followers online. All of them, individually. When they gathered their votes together, the vote of these four online giants was 81,000. Individually. That, that means, what it means is, that's not all the people they know. That's the people they know who are educated and buoyant enough to participate in the virtual world. Not to talk of the family, the friends, friends both from primary school, secondary school and university. Not to talk of their colleagues. But online, each of them had hundred, at least 100,000 followers. Plus family, plus classmates, plus friends, plus colleagues, and plus everybody they visited and told they were contesting for presidency. They gathered four votes, four of them, it was 81,000. That means each of them had, on the average, 20,000 votes. People that have more than 100,000 followers, family members, colleagues, associates, classmates, and uh, they traveled around, gave money to people, canvassed for support. God can use the internet to amplify his work. But your weight is not on the internet, it's in heaven. People now even pray online. Somebody is sick in the hospital, they will come and write online, Lord, heal him. Because they are God, is Facebook. <laughs> It's not like they are mobilizing prayer support through, the, through Facebook. Because you can come and write on Facebook, please pray for this person so that they can pray real time. But when you say it, they will not kneel down and pray. They will now say it's healed. They will say, Lord, please help our brother. Which Lord is that? He's the God of media. <laughs> Ecclesiastes chapter 12 verse 13. 
He said, this is the conclusion of the whole matter. He was trying to summarize human race. He said, fear God and keep his commandment. This is the whole duty of man. That's, that's the wise man speaking. This is the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God, keep his commandment. He said, this is the whole duty of man. The whole duty of man is to fear God. If you fear God, you will be correct in every other thing. These are wisdoms. Wisdoms that are eternal. And so if you don't fear God, you are primarily irresponsible. As far as spirituality is concerned. Some people here fear they are the traditions of their fathers more than God. My brother was telling me recently, a pastor's wife sent money to the elders in the village because they told her that there's a river that you don't go to if you are crossed from age. And she grew, she's past that age and crossed the river. And so when she got married, they said, if you don't send money to make appeasement before those spirits, your first son will die. And the pastor's wife, who comes from the altar every day to make faithful declaration, sent money to the elders to go and appease the gods in the village. Jesus said, you have made the word of God of none effect by your traditions. Some people, they honor and fear the way of life of the people around them more than God. So they derive their value from the value system of the society where they live. And you find men living such condescended life and devaluated existence because they don't reverence God. Deuteronomy chapter 10 verse 12 is there now Israel what does the Lord thy God require of thee? He said but to fear the Lord thy God. That's the only thing God is seeking from you. That's God talking to Israel. He said what is it that God requires of you? He said fear him is enough. The culture of the spiritual man. Spirituality is not a joke. In Job 28, verse 28, he said, And unto man he said, Behold, the fear of the Lord. He said, That is wisdom. He said, To depart from evil, that is understanding. And Peter. Reiterating the fact in First Peter chapter two verse seventeen said, "Honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, and honor the king. Fear God, reverence God." In First Samuel two thirty, say, "Him that honors me or reverences me, he say, him I will reverence. He say, him that despises me shall be lightly esteemed." So you cannot make kingdom impact if you don't fear God. These are the organic things that people don't see, but makes men. Most times we see the things that are superficial, and we copy those things. But those superficial things don't make men. Find a man that has authority with God. Find a man whom God exalts like a unicorn. Find a man who God glorifies. It's not the suit he wears. It's not the way he speaks. These are the bedrock. The spiritual realities that define that man. These are the things. He has hunger for God. He has fear for the Lord. He bears the bodies of the Father. This is what men don't see. And we think, to be honest, if spirituality is as shallow as you live it, do you really believe you will be able to those who are commanding so much authority will be commanding it by living it the way you are living it. Just by you stand up, you say, Shaba, 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 and Shaba, Shaba, and then you now wear a suit. You now come to a place, you want a cripple to walk. Because you wore a white suit. You compose yourself, you come somewhere and speak English. And you want the principality over that territory that makes claim over that territory for more than 50 years to move because you came and spoke English. 
the spirit that has ruled this city in violence for more than 40 years. This is a book where if you just touch somebody on the road and an argument begins, they can burn you immediately. That level of authority over the atmosphere, you want to shift it with this kind of shallow life. If your car touches somebody before you know what say you say Jack, they burn that car. And God help you that you don't speak well. They will burn you there too. This city that immorality looks like uh, exercise. Immorality. There are people who can't sleep a night without sex. Young ladies of 17 years old, they've done abortion three times. Somebody can just throw, say, let me see my friend at the backyard. And go there in 30 minutes. She's gone to have sex and come back. You were talking. She just felt like having sex. You will just walk up to the neighbor, have sex and come back. And continue talking. Even pastors are struggling. They are about to drown in the immorality. Sometimes you have to run out of Boko to go and pray somewhere and come back. Because to pierce the atmosphere in the city is hard. In the city, you, you, you come and, and, and speak English. <laughs> they will just look at you and say, Car. <laughs> If they are not careful, what they will do is that, number one, they will write a program for you. And in that program, there will be two, three full stop. One will be poverty. The other one will be hardship. The other one will be sorrow. The more you are working, the more you, you actually become smaller. When they see you after 10 years, your start, even your stature will reduce. The people who saw you 10 years before will come back and see you later. You become smaller. They say, what is happening? Because muscles are being burnt. Fat are dying. You don't stand up here. <laughs> you think you will call somebody and things will open. Do you know the gatekeepers that are here? The gatekeepers. They know the heritage of this land. It is captured in prophecy. That the men from this city are the people that will have the power to defeat Islam. And you think the spirits heard it and they will go and relax. The greatest warriors in Africa are from the chief nation. You think they will allow you to realize your destiny. They know you in the spirit. You are the only one who don't know yourself. In this country, sir, the greatest warriors, this is where they come from. If they carry spares, they are, they, are, they are like, the strength they have is like, what, what, what's the strongest warring creature? It's not just a lion. A lion is a fighter, but it doesn't have stamina. They, they don't just have power to fight, they have stamina. A thief man can remain in battlefield. They are like the Eliazas. They can fight for money tonight. When the thief man goes to farm, if you see what one person farms, you will think they use the tractor. If a thief man is farming yam, if he makes a heap, the heap will be as tall as him. You will be wondering, how did he do this? And some of them farm two ridges at the same time. Because there's no time. <laughs> Energy. And they think the devil will allow them to enter their destiny. And people from a place that have the destiny of overcomers want to live a shallow life and hope they can become Doesn't work like that. The fear of the Lord. You must fear God and tremble at God's word. If you want to become that man that can make impact. Number four is intensity. Intensity. A spiritual man is not lukewarm. Huh. 
He burns like a flame. In fact, one of the ways you will know a man is healthy is his intensity. Because if you stay in God's presence, something happens. It sharpens your edge. And intensity is not shouting. Intensity is weight in the spirit. When you sing, when you talk, people can resonate with it. In order to help us explain intensity in a way that we can apply it, let me define it in three ways. The first way you define intensity is what we call rage against the devil and his operations. Rage. A man who, is, who has intensity hates the operations of darkness. If he sees, the, if he sees people who are oppressed, if he sees the sick, if he sees those in sin, he hates what the devil is doing. He has this anger and aggression against demonic spirits and their oppression. That's when you know you have intensity. Intensity is not shouting. The second way you find a man who has intensity is numbness towards worldliness. Numbness. He doesn't like worldliness. Worldliness doesn't get to him. You can't be on fire. And all the songs that the secular music musicians are singing, you know all. You sing them at home. When you come to church, you sing church songs. When you go to the world, you sing the, the songs. No. A man who is on fire for God is numb towards the world. You can be in a bus and they are playing the secular music. You will not hear it till you drop. Not because you are trying to close your ear. You are too, you are somewhere else. Numbness. People are naked, you don't join them. Suddenly you find everybody tearing their jeans as if they are naked. And you find a music minister. He will tear his jeans and come and stand and, Hey, the Lord is good all the time. What is that? Get out from there. Which Lord is good? A new dance step comes out of the club. The music minister will come up and you see him doing praise on the altar. He's dancing. That's not a, that's not a Christian worshiper. Don't hear them. They will corrupt your soul. The other day they were singing praise and worship. I sat down and I saw one brother. <laughs> so this is, this is where you come from. I notify the HOD. Let him not sing again. Until God tells me that he's purified. So this is, this is who you are. <laughs> because they are vibrations. And those things transmit spirits. Talking words speak from the gutters. Dress code speak from the gutters. Lifestyle that is demonic. Do you think the world is evolving by human intelligence? The world is not evolving by human intelligence. Those are spiritual strategies for colonizing generations. And then you want to bring worldliness. You come for a miracle service. And somebody go and pick a dance or a song from the gutters. Come to pollute the atmosphere. And because discerning men are not around, everybody is jumping. A man who is on, who has, who is on fire and intense, he is numb. The things of the world doesn't get his attention. The world can do what they want to do. We don't follow the world. The world follows us. It's a going toward the world and disciple all nations. We disciple them. I don't want to be like the world. No. I come from a superior realm. Don't associate with such. Disease from them. End your friendship with them. Burn that bridge. It will take you to hell. They are sagging jeans. Everybody is sagging jeans. And the brother is sagging jeans. Is there anything wrong with it? No. Nothing is wrong, but it's worldly. And it means your allegiance is to another spirit, not God. I was sharing with them in church, humorously, last week. Four years ago, they say Fubu. Everybody's jeans is this wide. Four years later, they say Pencil. 
everybody's dream is life size. You think it's flash on? Those are spiritual control systems. To look for gullible people that they can prey upon. Or how can somebody who loved a white gene four years ago suddenly fall in love with a tight gene? What happened to his emotion? He's being controlled and regulated. And so anything they push into the atmosphere can regulate him. Wordliness. You are not on fire if you are worldly. You are not on fire if worldly things still get your attention. And the top thing that determines intensity is passion in doing the works of God. You say you are on fire. In one year you have not won so. In one month you have not won a so. No, no, no. That your fire is another type of fire. How can you be in a territory? Because soul winning is not just conscious. It's also unconscious. And nobody noticed that your life is different. How did you blend into the world so naturally that they didn't notice that you are not of this world? You are in a place for one month. You have not influenced and impacted anybody enough for him to want to follow your God. And you say you are on fire. No sir, you are not on fire. You are under that strong influence of adrenaline. If you are on fire, it would have contacted, afflicted somebody enough to want to follow your God. We have reduced Christianity to a cliche. That's why it's so powerless. You don't hate demons and their operations. You are not numb towards the world. And you are not passionate about kingdom things. How dare you talk about fire? You don't know it. And so a spiritual man is a man of intensity. He is on fire for God. In Hebrews 1 7, he says he makes his angels spirits. He says, but his ministers, they are flames of fire. In Matthew 3 11, he says, I baptize you with water. He says, but the one that comes after me is greater than I. He says, he will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. It's intensity. Every man who is the spiritual man is a man of great intensity. And the way you see intensity is hatred. If I see somebody who is demonized, I, I'm let loose immediately. I can't allow it. Demons. Ah, oh, no, no, no. You don't pray. Come on! Even my voice will change immediately. My actions, everything will change. I hate demons. Somebody is oppressed. You can't be there. You are too on fire to tolerate it. And I hate worldliness. You can't hang around me. They talk. I say, what language is that? You don't come around me and speak nonsense. You heard something on BB Niger. You bring it to choke my atmosphere. You can't even be worldly and hang around me for too long. My friends, no. It, it doesn't work. It's not compatible. Light and darkness don't coexist. And I'm not saying dress like an ancient prophet. That's not what I'm saying. Be smart, be clean, be modest. I'm not saying be dressing like 1940. My friend is wearing a clean traditional with it, a sneakers. That's clean, that's excellent. But he can't stand his trouser. It's rubbish. We are spiritual men. We hate the devil. The Bible says you love righteousness and hate iniquity. We hate the devil and his oppression. We are dead to the world. Paul said, I'm crucified to the world and the world is crucified to me. And we are passionate about the things of God. He said, Paul and Barnabas, these be the men that have started their lives for the kingdom. These are organic things that defines the spiritual man. Number six, a spiritual man waits on God. There's a culture of waiting. Oh, that's number five. He waits on God. No matter how busy he is, and no matter how fast this world is, there's a place where he slows down and stays with God. And allow God to have his way. Because God is a king spirit. You will not find a man who says he's spiritual, who has not mastered waiting. Because you can pray fast and go away, not waiting. Because in the place of waiting is the business of the glory you are doing. And the glory is like dew. 
it descends, it takes time. And that's where you, a spiritual man builds his strength. The strength of a spiritual man comes from the presence of God. Isaiah 40 verse 31. He said, they that wait upon the Lord. He said, they renew their strength. He said, they mount up with wings like the eagles. He said, they run, they don't faint. They walk, they are not weary. Your strength is not your intelligence. Ah! Spirit will mess you up. When you run the race of life, you will see how many times your intelligence will fail you. In fact, before you get to verse 31, if you read from verse 28, the Bible said, Have you not heard? He said, Has it not been said to you that the everlasting God fainted not? Neither is he weary. He said, He giveth power to the faint, and not to them that have no might, he increases strength. And in case you think it's youthfulness, he now gave you a quick contract. He said, Even the youth shall faint, the young men shall utterly fall. So what he's talking about is an ability that is superior to natural tendencies. If a spiritual momentum, we build it in God's presence. And the way we build that strength is that as we stay with God, the dew doesn't just rest. We also ascend into the realm of God. That's why I say he mounts up with wings. There is a wind you have. There are wings you have in the spirit that will never come alive unless as you wait on God. You will be earthly. They will choke you with the, the language in Boko. They will choke you with the corruption in Boko. The only way you can ascend above this atmosphere is when you learn how to wait. It's a darkness that covers the earth and grows darkness the people. But you must have to arise to be able to shine. The way you arise is by waiting so that you mount up with wings. You cannot be walking under the thick atmosphere of Boko and not be corrupted by it unless you learn how to ascend above it. Yeah, yeah. Ah 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 uh, 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 uh. Now these five things I've shared Are the organic ones So there are three other ones That are more external This message may not profit most of you You know there are certain messages you grow into When you hear it later It will bless you more And please, please, please Don't get me wrong I'm not trying to undermine anybody and I'm not trying to be arrogant. But trust me, when pastors hear this message, this message, they will know what I'm talking about. I'm only teaching this here because I believe God wants to raise many of you. I know some of you will be more interested if I'm talking mysteries with energy and fire. Then you'll be doing like this. Hey. If this one is for those who are already in the mission, in the field of battle, they will know this thing. If a man has been injured before because he took off, he will understand the power of waiting. <laughs> he will not understand. I came to one only to preach. And you know utterance, utterance, they, sometimes the inspiration and the energy is bought. And I was talking, I was vibrating. Because when you are prayed by the spirit of utterance, sometimes you yourself become volatile. So you become like a mist. You, you spread over the people. You vanish into the atmosphere. It, it's as if you are talking from Zion into it. And I got to that ascended level. And I judged the prince over the city. Ah! And the, the Holy Ghost was trying to restrain me. That No, no. Deal with demons now. Deal with demons. Leave princes. Leave princes. There are issues. You have issues. You have issues. There's anger. There's pride. They will use it to kill you. I didn't know. I thought when you are high, you can address anything. He said, the prince of this world come to me. He finds nothing. If he finds something, he's a legalistic being. He's a lawyer. He knows how to take your iniquity and your error and use it against you in Zion. Ah, I said, no, no. You heard. 
as I was driving home, the front left tire of my car exploded. I said, oh, 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 I'm excited. I was speeding. I slowed down. The same tire exploded again. I had to come out quickly and say, Lord, have mercy. Because they that call upon the name of the Lord, they shall be saved. Have mercy. Have mercy. We are dealing with princes. The Bible calls them princes. These are legalistic beings. They, he said, even Gabriel, even Michael, the archangel, when he came against Satan, he didn't use reviling words. He said, the Lord rebuke you. Get, Michael had to also stay under government to be able to fight. Because the battle is legalistic. Michael, that's a cherub. <laughs> and they were talking, he said, most of these people, he said, they speak against dignitaries. Because they don't know the way of the spirit. This is what makes a man strong in the spirit. These are the things that give credence and validation to your fasting, your prayer, and your declaration. If you don't have these things, there are certain declarations you will make that will put you in trouble. If you don't have these things, there are certain declarations you will make that will kill you. Have you not seen young ministers make declarations from meeting, came back, fell, and died? They are mysteries. You can't explain them. This is why. Because the spirit realm is legalistic. And you'll be wondering why. Living worldly, carnally, in secret, and coming to do business that is meant for princes in Zion. You are not standing on your throne and you want to talk. You want to talk to another being that is an enthroned personality. How do you fight the battle of thrones when the legalities are not kept? Number six, a spiritual man walks in light. He walks in light. This one is a deliberate thing. Walking in light simply means walking only under the dictates of the word of God. In John chapter 1 verse 4, Speaking about the word, he said that word is light. And he said that light is the light of men. And so, you are not spiritual if you are still functioning by human philosophy. You are not spiritual if you are still functioning by human ideologies. You are not spiritual if you are still functioning by customs and traditions of your people. You come, they say, this is how we do it. There is nothing like this how we do it. The church in Boko is the same as the church in Ghana. It's the same as the church in America. We are all the ecclesia of God. We are from Zion. And so the only thing that harmonizes us is the spirit and the word. And so there is nothing you do like a thief man. You are not supposed to operate like a thief man. You are a new creature. That's who you are. You are a new creature operating in a thief land. So this idea of encasing yourself in thief philosophy... Teeth culture and teeth tradition is a, it negates your potential in the spirit. He said in Zion we have become one man in Christ. And the way we operate is by the word. When you start walking in light, he said the wall of partition between the Jews and the Gentiles have been divided. In Job 24, 29 verse 4, he said, As I was in the days of my youth. When the secret of God was upon my tabernacle, he said, by light, I walk through darkness. By light, I walk through darkness. In 1 John 1, 7, he said, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, the blood of Jesus cleanses us. So everybody who says is a spiritual man walks in light in perpetuity. Every aspect of his life, there's a revelation. Why are you doing this ministry? God said, why do you marry this person? God said. Why are you in this city? God said. He doesn't have a life outside the world. That's a spiritual man. You don't go to Abuja because it's, it, there are potentials there. You don't come to Boko because it's your fatherland. You came because God sent you. You go to Abuja because God sent you. That's the way of a spiritual man. And Lord who decided to go because of green pasture, he ran out with two of his daughters. If I asked you now to take a survey of your life and we compartmentalize your life into eight you'll be shocked 
that some of us here, not up to three out of that eight, are we living or doing because God said, there's no water. There's no water. Why are you in Boko? Why are you doing the work you are doing? Why do you marry or did you marry who you married? There's no God in it. And you wake up because you closed your hands, eyes and lifted your hands in church. You say you are a spiritual man. You are a religious man. Not spiritual. And you will be weak. Because the day the devil comes. <laughs> you will see some things though. And so if there is something you are doing now that God didn't speak. Better go back to God quickly. Isolate a verdict. Isolate a word for that thing. <laughs> when we started traveling. I had to go and pray. Because I discovered I had phobia for traveling. I don't like movement. Ah, no, 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 no. If you enter a gallop, I turn quickly my whole attention. The adrenaline secretion is quite rapid. I had to start traveling. Every week, I had to go and stay with God. And I kept talking. I kept praying. And God reminded me of a word He gave me before. He said, before, because I leave, you will see tomorrow. Now, when they are driving me, he knows. 80% of the time, I'm sleeping. When they reach, they tap me, they say, we have come. Uh -huh. I stand up. Because I leave, you will see tomorrow. And we made crazy journeys. Crazy. Crazy journeys. In pursuit of soul winning and glorification of the name of the Lord. The other time, me and Pastor Sonny were driving towards Cameroon. In the night. And we were making some recordings. <laughs> the other time we were driving somewhere in Nunewi. The, there was hold up. The road we followed. They say people don't follow them. That bush. The paths are overlaid with bushes. Please. Endure the hold up. In fact when we were traveling. We saw calabash and other things. We began to record. That this one is part of our, our trophies. That we too pass on pathways. Because the devil will come to kill you for serving God. What will ensure you is the word you are standing on. And if there's no word, better fight well. Because that one now will be dependent on your strength. That's why I say if you fail in the day of trouble, your strength is little. If God didn't give you a word, it's your strength in the spirit that will preserve you. And if the battles are many, at some point you'll be overwhelmed. A spiritual man walks in light. Number seven. A spiritual man is given to service. As far as is concerned, the summary of his life is service. In Matthew 23 verse 11, it says, He that is greatest among you shall be the servant of all. In 1 Corinthians 9.19, it says, For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant of all that I may gain more. That's Paul speaking. A preacher man is a man of service. The reason is because, number one, his promotion is tied to service. In Luke 16, 10 and 12, he said, if you are not faithful in another man's business, who will give you yours? And he said, he that is faithful in little is faithful in much. So the way God judges your faithfulness and your heart posture is in service. You will not know you are proud until you are serving. And they now tell you, please sweep the floor. You will now say, ah, ah. Of all the people here, am I the one to sweep the floor? If not you, who should? <laughs> That's the problem. You can't be trimmed until you start serving. You will see something. You will call, they will not pick. Anger will rise. You will still have to call again. Because it's your father's business. So you will die to many things. That's why service trains you in spirituality. In fact, when God wants to help you, He sends you to service. It helps God to check your faithfulness. And on the basis of that, God promotes you. It also helps God to build humility into your heart. Many times you will not be appreciated. Ask God, those who serve, they will tell you. The least appreciated people are those who serve. They will literally forget. 
if you want to ask a man who doesn't pack this equipment to pack it, you will consciously ask him. And you will do it politely and even beg him. But if you want to ask a man who has been packing it to pack it, you will now come with rebuke. And say, why have you not packed these things? A service not yet over. The one who doesn't serve, you will beg him. Because you, say, you know say, if you don't do that, he will walk away. But the one who serves is the one you will forget to say thank you. That's the one you will rebuke. And that's how God raises them. So when you want to find a man who is truly spiritual, he has a robust record of service. He knows rebuke. He knows betrayer. He knows reproach in service. All of those things are there, notwithstanding he's still pursuing God. So that kind of pursuit is genuine. He has been embarrassed because of this before. He has suffered reproach. He has suffered betrayal. All kinds of things. But he's able to bury all of those things and still keep his hunger for God. That's the servant of God. And you want to take book? You want God to use you? You must become a spiritual man. These are the cultures of a spiritual man. And finally, a spiritual man is full of thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. No matter what happens to him, he's full of thanksgiving. Acts 16, 25 and 26. They flogged Paul and Silas, threw them in prison. The Bible said at midnight. He said, Paul and Silas, they prayed. They gave thanks. The prisoner heard them. How can they flog you? God didn't show up. They threw you in prison. There was no hope of deliverance. And you are thanking God. The question now is, what are the words you are using to thank God? And what are you thanking Him for? Are you thanking Him for the beating? Are you thanking Him for the hopelessness? Are you thanking Him for the frustration? No. You are thanking Him for who He is. Because who he is, is not defined by what he does. No matter what he does or does not do, he is what he is, regardless. And you are also thanking him because it is a privilege to suffer reproach for him. When the apostles were beaten, they said they came to their own company and they gave thanks that they too were privileged to suffer reproach for Christ. That's the spiritual man. Not this gullible Christianity we are doing now. It's only when you get a car miraculously. You will never hear somebody who comes to give thanks and say, I went to preach, I was insulted. Or and say, I was thrown in prison for going to preach. Or, I went somewhere for evangelism, my car was stolen. I thank God that I'm able to give up something for the kingdom. Because our Christianity and our doctrine is perverted. That's why our Christianity triggers lust. Triggers self. And not the ways of the spirit. In the days of the apostles, they thank God for what they lost for Jesus. Because they knew that thing produced eternal reward. Today, if you are even thanking God for souls won, people are wondering, why are we wasting time? The kind of thanksgiving they want to hear is, I didn't know how it happened. All of a sudden, somebody just credited me an alert. And you want to shout, they say, wait, wait. That alert is the fifth digit. Then the whole church will be, hey, praise God. If somebody now comes out and says, yesterday, by the grace of God, I won five souls to the kingdom. If somebody has now comes and says, yesterday, I went for evangelism and somebody stole my car. Uh-uh. Is that thanksgiving? Our values are wrong. I'm not saying they will steal your car. But I'm saying even if you lose something for the kingdom, it's a blessing. Don't worry. I know some people have been waiting for when I will pray. The message was wasting their time. So let me stop wasting your time and pray for the sick. Aliyah, 
this happen is by authority. When God has invested authority, a kind or a measure of authority on you, 